Hey guys, today we're going to talk about how to build a deck. How to build a deck has always been one of the most highly requested video topics, so I'm going to go through my process today. And there's a lot of ways to build a deck. I don't think there's a right way, so I'm going to share what works best for me. If you guys find something that works better for you, that's great. Just uh, share it in the comments. People love to hear these different ideas. And also, it's going to be the start of a more general Gwent strategy content series. So if you like it, let me know, and also tell me what other, con or other topics you want to see covered in this. To start off with though, we're going with a new player guide. Don't know how many new players there are, but I felt this wouldn't be a complete guide without a new player section. If you guys have been playing for a while, feel free to skip ahead in the chapters. Uh, I felt this guide wouldn't be complete without this though, so let's get started. So you're a new player, you start playing Gwent, you finish a tutorial, and you're enjoying the game. At least I assume you're enjoying the game, otherwise it'd be pretty weird for you to be looking up a deck building guide, but whatever. Right now, you have the starter decks and probably a small collection, looking to build like your first real deck, or maybe you tried and didn't go so well, or it went well and you want to make it better. Either way, let's get started. There's six factions in Gwent. There's the Squiatel, Syndicate, Skellige, Nilfgaard, Monsters, and Northern Realms. And just pick a faction to start with. I would just recommend choosing whatever faction you like the flavor of or find most interesting, instead of worrying about which is the strongest. People always ask which faction to start with. I say just pick the one you like the best. Because whichever one's the strongest depends, and the best decks are changing, and they usually require like a specific combination of cards that you probably won't have as a new player anyway. So it's most important just to have fun playing the game, and then as you're having fun playing the game, you earn rewards, you can increase your collection, make more decks, try different factions, all that good stuff. But just pick whichever faction most interests you to start with. So we've got a faction. Each of these has leader abilities. So, for example, here we're going to make a new deck. We'll go into a Skellige here, and we see all these leader abilities you have to choose from. Each of them has something different. Some offer strong one-time effects. So, for example, you've got a one-time effect on something like Blaze of Glory here. One-time effect. Other ones have effects that have value over time. So, for example, the Onslaught has a passive here. Whenever enemy becomes damaged, give everything in your hand one armor. It's a passive effect. And some do both. Like, this also has one-time effect here to do damage. So, to start building a deck, you need to pick a leader. Um, you can always change these later on. So, you can just pick a leader... Like, say I just pick this and build my deck, I can always come back and change the leader without having to remake the deck. So, you can always come back and do that. So, we're just going to pick this, and once we're in the deck builder here, uh, we can just have a few things to keep in mind, right? So, every deck has to have at least 25 cards. You can look at the top left here, and it tells us this information. We've got 25 cards in a deck. You can technically have more than 25 cards, but you really don't want to, because with pretty much no exceptions, you're going to want exactly 25 Having less cards in your deck increases the chance of seeing your good cards when you draw. And it also ties in a lot to the next topic, which is going to be provisions. So every card in one is balanced around a number of provisions. So we take a card here, we can see how many provisions it is. So down here, this bottom right corner, that's the amount of provisions the card is. Cards that have more value or play for more points tend to have more provisions. So this is a high provision card here. With cards with less value tend to be less provision points. So we like go down here. We see, like, this doesn't play for quite as many. Although, the first example isn't the best, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, this doesn't mean that low provision cards are bad cards, though. They can be very impactful and make up a lot of the support of the whole strategy of your deck. And you'll need to include some anyway because of the next thing, which is a uh, provision limit. So up here in the top left, you can also see we've got 25 units, at least 25 cards, minimum of 13 units, which we'll talk about later. And then here, the deck provisions, we cannot exceed 165. So this number is 150 plus the number of provisions each leader provides. So if we go back, just exit the self saving, delete it. We go take a look here. We go back to scale. You see these leader abilities. This is 150 plus this number of provisions. They're usually pretty similar, the amount of provisions each deck gets. Um, there's a couple that are less, like this one monstrous one has 12, but more or less, they're usually around 15 ish. So that's just something to keep in mind here. Let's go back in the deck editor real quick. So, each leader that, like, the, we showed you a couple that had less provisions. Those abilities are usually considered more powerful in a vacuum, but it doesn't mean the decks with them are stronger or weaker. They just have slightly less provisions or slightly more to make up for that. What you want is the leader that synergizes best with the deck that you're going to make, and then work within the provision limit that gives you. So, when we're making the deck, we can include cards from our faction or neutral cards. So, we take a look here in the editor here. You can see that we have neutral cards. We can pick any of these for our Skellige deck or we can play any number of Skellige cards. This here is just some, there are a few cards that have dual faction. These are Syndicate and Skellige, but they're also, there's just still Skellige cards, so you can put these in. 
There are very few of those, and it's, they're basically just treated as if they were Skellige cards for this purpose. So when you pick these cards to put in your deck, we have these, and there's also within this gold and bronze cards. Gold cards tend to be stronger, higher provision, play for more points, and you can only include one copy of a gold card in your deck. So for example, we have Blood Eagle here. This is a gold card. We can only put one Blood Eagle into our deck. Bronze cards, on the other hand, are typically not as strong, or they, yeah, generally because they're not as strong, and they're usually less provisions. Gold cards are like the premium cards that have a lot of value in them most of the time, but bronze cards can be really good too. And if you look at them, we can include up to two bronze cards. We can put up to two of the Samum into our deck. There's three types of cards in the game. I should probably mention this as well. If we take a look at card type here, we have units, which are, I mean, they're, they're units. <laughs> That's what they say they are. Uh, they have a number at the top. So if we take a look at, for example, this one here, this is its value of points when you play on the board. You probably all know this from the tutorial, but I just kind of wanted to go through everything. Make sure I just didn't miss anything. I've got the provisions down here, and they usually have some ability when you play them. So this has an ability. We must have at least 13 units. That's what this minimum 13 here is for. So you have to keep at least 13 units in your deck. Special cards, if we take a look at those, these tend to be one-time cards that are played for some effect. So you play this card, it does some effect, and the card's in the graveyard. And it just goes there once it's resolved. And yeah, these just tend to have one-time effects that you play for something. And then the last type is the artifact here. Artifacts usually stay on the board for the round after you play them. And they usually have some effect you can activate later in the round. So take a look at this one. It has some effect when we play it. It stays on the round, and then we can trigger this order later on when we want to. So that's usually how these type of cards works. Um, there are exceptions to each of these, but most units, specials, and artifacts work like that. The last thing here you might have seen is the stratagems. Uh, you start off with, I believe, the tactical advantage. If you go first, you get a stratagem to help make up for generally going second being more useful a lot of the time. But this isn't as important as the types of units because most often you just pick you just pick one of these, and then most of the time you're building your deck with the actual units and specials and artifacts. So now we know the rules for building our deck. What do we want to include? So most decks have a core strategy, and the cards in the deck support that strategy. So, for example, if we in Nilfgaard, if we go back real quick here, let's go to Nilfgaard. This will be an example. So, I'll just pick one of these. Doesn't really matter because we can always change it later. Like I said, there are cards that have the assimilate. So, assimilate here is a keyword, and when you boost, you boost the selected unit by the amount. Whenever you play a card that's not from your starting deck, so we have assimilate on this diviner. If we were to play a card that wasn't in our starting deck, this would get one point. And that's an example of like a strategy. We could go with Assimilate. So we'd probably want to make an Assimilate deck. We'd include some Assimilate cards, like a couple of these. Like maybe this has Assimilate on it. Maybe this does. So that makes a lot of sense. And then we would have to play other cards that support it. So this gets points when we play something that wasn't in our starting deck. A card, for example, like Stefan Skellen. This is just an example. He plays an Ace Up the Sleeve for your three tactics in your starting deck. Tactics are a type of special card, in case you didn't know. So if you have a bunch of tactics in your starting deck, he plays several of these Ace Up the Sleeves. These weren't in our starting deck, so each one would boost our Assimilate cards. That's a synergy. That could be the basis of like your strategy. And you'd fill in, right, like this requires tactics. You'd want to play tactics, so you'd play cards that synergize with tactics. You get the idea. It's how you build decks like around a synergy. Most decks are built around a synergy. Some aren't, but most usually are, or at least some amount of synergy within them. So, once you've picked out the strategy you want to go for, it's time to go on to the next part of the guide, and let's start really getting into building our deck. Alright, let's talk about more of the advanced stuff now. So, first of all, I want to show you guys the most and uh, best way to actually make a deck. We're going to have to cut away for this one. Let's just go here, go to... Let's go to a YouTube channel, for example. I, I know the best YouTube channel is um, called The Platinum Patrol. So, we're just going to hit up that channel and <laughs> go to its most recent deck list, like... And they see, usually if you go to a guide or a deck list, they'll have this little link here. Click on that deck link, hit copy, paste, or import. Got your deck. It's the best way. <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. I'm just kidding. You can get other ones from playgwent.com. Um, Reddit probably has deck lists. I don't go there very often, but there are definitely ways to find decks. 
on the internet and meta snapshots uh, team elder blood usually has a really good one where they list the best decks for the current patch you can see what's working out pretty well there so there are ways to get these off the internet net decking is what's called to get internet a deck off the internet it's a, not a bad way to quickly find out if you like a deck or just try it out especially if you're a good card this is this works much better if you're a good card collection right if you have a bunch of cards and you don't know what you want to play you can go look up decks try them out real quick see what you like then make your own changes and adjustments that's fine but this guide is for building your own decks, mostly from scratch, since that's what most people seem to be interested in. And the other way is um, not very hard. So I am to show you how I go about building my decks in Gwent. There's a lot of ways to make decks, but I'm just going go through my process and the things I consider when I'm building mine. So like I said, this is going to be the advanced guide. I'm just calling that so we all feel special for being here, right? Like We all like being special, we're all advanced. So I'm going to assume you're, if you're watching this, you know the basics of the game, how deck building works. It's mostly stuff I cover in the beginner guide. If you don't, go check that out and come back. So before we get to really building our deck, there is going to be some information, which is, it just has to happen. And I found thinking through these things and planning makes a much better deck building process and a better deck overall once we're done. So that's just something to keep in mind. But we're getting to it, and then we're going to build, I'm going to build the deck using the process that I'm going to explain to you guys as an example as we go along. Hopefully that helps out and makes you understand what I'm talking about. So let's get started. We have an idea about what we want to make our deck with. Maybe you're talking to a friend. Maybe you saw something on the ladder. That's usually how I make my decks. I see something funny on the ladder and I want to try that out. Or maybe you just want to try out some cards you haven't before. I do this. You guys used to, well, let's still do it sometimes, but I have that uh, discussion day series where I talk about cards. Usually people suggest a card. I go check it out, play it. Maybe then I'm inspired to put a deck with it. Whatever the idea is, wherever you get it from, it doesn't matter. But let's just start here. We've got the idea. We don't have the deck. The first thing I want to do once I have an idea is determine what type of deck it'll be. So there's three main types of decks. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. If you already know these, feel free to skip ahead. But engine decks. So engine decks focus on engine cards. These are cards that play for much more than the expected value of a card of its provision value, usually over time. And they're usually susceptible to removal. And the deck can struggle if their engine cards are being destroyed or in short rounds. Because like I said, usually they gain value over time. Short rounds have less time. However, they tend to be good against point slam decks, and the point slam decks just have trouble matching the value of the engines over time. So the engine decks tend to be really good at long rounds. The next deck is going to be a control deck. These decks focus on controlling the board. This usually means killing opponent's units, but there can be other ways to control the board, but usually it means killing opponent's units. These tend to be weak against point slam decks, since the control cards usually have less value than others. Um, for example, we look at Alzer's Thunder here real quick. This is a generic example of a control card it's five provisions deals five damage so that's decent value but if we take a look at for example the elder bear which is kind of the generic example of a general card it's six provisions for only, or six value for only four provisions and it's got no abilities so it's you can see like its value is higher for less provisions so a lot of the value from control cards has to come from them removing stuff value that's valuable so they tend to be less value for their provisions, which is why they're struggling against point slam decks. But they can be really good against engine decks, because engine decks, if their engines are dying, they can really struggle. And if they can't get their engine strategy going, the control deck can kind of take over and do whatever it wants and shut down the engines. And the last deck we mentioned a couple times here is point slam decks. These focus on playing high cards, or high value cards, and high tempo. So they're usually weak against engine decks, uh, take a look at an example of a point slam card here. Like the most generic example is probably old Spear Tip, just from the old days when he was like the highest power card in the game. So you got no ability. He plays for 12 points. That's a lot of points, and it's a lot of points right away. So that's what we're talking about. Like point slam cards like to do stuff like that. So that's what they do, and they usually do well against the control decks because usually the control decks are less efficient with their provisions because they're relying on getting value from killing stuff. But the engine decks over time. They get more than expected value from the engine cards. They tend to outvaluing the point slam decks a lot of the time. We also like the uh, point slam decks that also tend to like short rounds. Just because playing big things in one card or a couple cards tends to be really good for winning short rounds. Uh, naturally, there's exceptions to the rule for each of these types of decks, right? Like some point slam decks have a lot of control. Some point slam decks have a lot of engine value. It depends on the deck. And also, every deck really tends to include a combination of engines and points slam and control. Usually, decks are a mix, but most decks can be defined as primarily one of these types. And that's how I think about them when I start working on my deck. So, 
before we want to get on to it, actually, we have to, we have to mention one more type of deck. That's a combo deck. Combo decks are built around a specific combination of cards, hence combo, that should theoretically win you the round. And most of the time, you want this round to be round three, so you win the game from performing your combo. So, ideally, the combo deck, if you pull off the combo, should win the game irrelevant to whatever else happened in the game, which is why people tend to dislike playing against them, because it seems like a lot of the game didn't really matter. So, for example, Northern Realms has a Traveling Priestess plus Onager combo. If you take a look at Traveling Priestess, this is just an example, right? Most of you probably seen this if you're veteran players, right? So, this gains a charge when it's put back in your deck. Gains charge when you put this back on your deck. And then has order to boost units by one. And it gains zeal if it's inspired. So, give this thing a boost, it's zeal. And you get as many charges on this as possible. And then you play it with this card called Onager, which I'm sure all of you love if you've been playing for a little bit. So, whenever you use an order, damage enemy by one. The Traveling Priestess has a whole bunch of orders charged up. So the combo works as you go to round three. These two cards are the only thing in your deck. You play the card Vernon Roche. This is just a combo example, but I'm going through it in case people are unaware of what the combo is if you're a newer player. You play the top two cards of your deck. If the only two cards in your deck are Onager and Traveling Priestess, you will play them. And then you fire the Traveling Priestess's order a whole bunch of times and boost up your other Onager, for example, if it's the only card you have. Each time you do this, you get a point for on the boost, and then the Onager fires off a damage. And this should be enough to just win round three when you're the end. That's an example of a combo deck. They are really, really good, usually, if the combo goes off. Like, if the combo works out, usually they win the game. At least that's the goal. Um, but they're vulnerable to having their combo interrupted. Like, say you are bleeding out their cards round two. Bleeding usually just means you won round one, you're forcing your opponent to play cards to round two they don't want to. By keep, keeping on playing. If they get their combo interrupted like that, they can be weak, and they can be inconsistent because you need a certain set of cards for it to work. So, just had to mention combo decks. So, we know the types of decks now. The purpose of this guide, I'm going to be able to be building a Skellige Rain deck. Uh, my Skellige Rain deck is going to be a engine deck. So, to start off with, we're going to go to new deck, we're going to go to Skellige. We're going to go to Rage of the Sea. This is the best synergy for me because we're playing a rain-based deck. This makes rain. And we know how many provisions we've got with this now. 165 and then next up we want to focus on the type of deck i said it's gonna be an engine deck get a lot of value from certain cards and <laughs> it's gonna be kind of crazy hopefully so anyway we want to get a bunch of value from these cards over time most of these cards called messenger from the sea but others as well so engine focus deck let's get started this next up i think actually is super important and it's identifying our win conditions so this is really handy because it lets you know in different situations how you're going to plan to win those situations. So, for example, like we could just say our deck's an engine deck. Okay, we'll keep our engines alive and they'll outvalue the opponent in long rounds. So we'll win that way. That's fine, but I like to go past that and look at different situations for my win conditions. So usually games are either involve short, medium, or long rounds. Um, for this video, I'm going to call a round that's four or less cards short. You can't really have a card... Uh, around less than three cards unless you're milled um five to seven cards medium and eight to ten cards long there's no like real standard definition um or strict one i just decided to go with these you could say seven cards is long for example i would not argue with you also mainly going to be focusing on the long and short rounds here like i mentioned medium but long and short rounds have the most extreme differences and usually the medium ones are like a mix of both and it's kind of muddy like which is what you do in those rounds so we'll mostly focus on long and short rounds for this purpose here so, when building a deck, I want to identify my win conditions, right? We said that. But I want to identify them for different situations. So I want to have a plan for my deck for at least a long and a short round, because those are the more extreme situations, and usually you end up with a long and a short round in most games, or you end up with like two mediumish rounds, or three mediumish rounds, you know. But if there's a long round, there's usually a short round as well. So I want to have a way to win both of those. If you can't win both of those, you're probably going to struggle because at some point you're going to end up in the type of round you don't want to be in. And since my deck is an engine deck, it's a rain, rain engine deck, in a long round we should win by outvaluing our opponents with our rain synergies. That's our primary strategy. And that's not our only plan for a long round, though. Because we have other options, and I want to include Ryogan the Undying. So if we take a look at Ryogan real quick. Probably should have showed Messenger from the Sea there. It's talking about engines, but oh well. So Ryogan the Undying here. He gives us essentially a secondary win condition, or almost like a combo effect, right? So when he's summoned from the graveyard, he triggers all the rain and storm on the board. If we build up a lot of rain and storm, 
just massively boosts our messenger from the sea, which now we do have to show you, so I should definitely have done it earlier, but uh, it is what it is. Messenger from the sea is our primary engine card for this deck. Whenever rain or storm damages enemy units, boost self by the amount of damage dealt. That's going to be a ton of damage, a ton of points over time. That's our goal. So, speaking of Ryogan, we want to include him. When we revive him, he massively boosts the messengers because it triggers off the rain and storm, and then potentially kills off the enemy units, which is really good. He almost gives us a combo deck. Like, you can make combo decks around Ryogan. I'm just including him as an almost like an alternate win condition, right, in a long round. Because sometimes the opponent will outvalue us in the long round. This gives us, like, another way to just win the long round if we get a lot of rain up and trigger this. So this is another win condition we wouldn't normally have. So that's two win conditions so far, really. Like him, and then the regular rain value stuff, right? So as we're going through building our deck, I want to include the Ryogan, and we definitely want to include the Messengers from the Sea, because those are like the core cards we've got so far. Now, one other thing is to revive the Ryogan, we need ways to revive him. And we or revive him, I mean, by revive, I mean summon or play from the graveyard. So we need ways to do that. The best ways to do that are going to be Fakusha, because she has a play a non-nutrient from a graveyard. She's one way. And then we're going to put in a second way, which is going to be... Right. Where is right? There it is. Sigdruf is right. There we go. So there's two ways to revive the Ryogan here. That's pretty good, I think. And this is also going to help us out with our backup plan. So I talked about wanting to win a long and a short round. Having cards that play for a lot of value at once is the best way to win a short round, like high tempo, high value cards. Melusine. So where is Melusine? There you are. Melusine. There you are. So she increases her base power over time. In addition to being an engine card, she spawns us this rain. So she fits into two things here that's really good. She gives us more rain, which is good for our primary strategies, which is getting that rain out, getting the Rio gone. There's a lot of value, the messenger from the sea. She also increases her base power, though, so we can leverage that um, for a big short round point slam card. Like, if she gets up to, like, 20 or so base power, we can potentially revive her with the same cards we're using for Ryogan, the Fakusha and Seifer's Right, which is a really big, just short round of play. So we're going to include that for her. Or her for that, I mean. <clears throat> uh, we can also use Ryogan and Fakusha for a short round, right? Like if you revive Ryogan with Fakusha, the Fakusha will spawn a couple turns of rain, and then the Ryogan will trigger that raid, and you'll get, um, if you have a leader charge left over, which is, if you're going to do this, you probably want a leader charge. You say one leader charge, Rage of the Sea, then we go Fakusha, Ryogan. That could be a short round win condition too, right? Because that gives us, what is that, um, 6 plus 8 is 14. 14 points of value, 4 turns of rain, and then the Ryogan triggers all the rain. That's like 22 points. That's pretty good value. Like, that's an option for a short round as well. If we lose our Malouse scene, like she just heat waved or something. So I like to think of my win conditions as primary and secondary. You probably already heard me say that, actually. So I consider primary win conditions the ideal scenario for our deck. Where secondary ones are how we win a situation we're not aiming to get into. So most of the time, we want to go to a long round and do our long round rain stuff, right? That's primary. Sometimes we'll end up in a short round, and we have a secondary win condition for that if we are, which is reviving our Malouse scene. So we'll take a look here. For my rain deck, I'm just going to quantify them out real quick. Win long round with a rain strategy, primary win condition. We talked about that, Messenger from the Sea. Win a long round with Ryogan's Revival effect. We can do that without the Messenger, just because how much damage it does. So it is another primary win condition we have for us. We want to be reviving Ryogan and doing that at some point in most of our games. We've got our two secondary win conditions here. One is to win a short round three by reviving Melusine after she gets really big. That's our best case for a short round. And then... We don't always want to end up in a short round, though. Like, we're not aiming to go short round, but sometimes you do. And our last uh, secondary win condition is going to be reviving our Ryogan with our Fakusha. Preferably with a leader charge as an option as well. So, if everything goes according to our plan, we'll play the two primary win conditions, or just two of the primary win conditions, I should say, like long rounds with Rain and long rounds with Ryogan. And that's our primary win condition. We can use the Ryogan effect, too, right? Like I said. Uh, most of the time, we don't really want to go short round. Just because we have options for a short round doesn't mean we want to go there every game. We can go there. If there's a long round, a lot of times there ends up being a short round, so we want to consider that as well. And our secondary win conditions are planned for we do get in that situation. Keep in mind, by the way, that sometimes, based on the matchup or based on how the game starts, you do want to play towards your secondary win conditions, right? Like, For example, say we're playing a deck that's really heavy on engines as well as we are. 
but we think that our round three is better in a short round because our Malusian's bigger than whatever their finisher card is. In that case, we do want to play towards our secondary win condition, where we go long round one and try and get down to that short round three, where our round three is better than the opponent. So it's important to have secondary win conditions you can play for in these situations. Um, otherwise, your deck might struggle when you end up there, but that's why I think it's important to have both. So the first thing we do here is now we think about identify our win conditions. We did that. We did that. We put the cards in. We know what we're going to do for these cards, right? These are our win condition cards most of the time. Now, one thing to remember is that I've found in both my decks and decks I've seen other people play is that neglecting a secondary win condition for when the game isn't going how you want is the most common way a deck loses. Like this applies for my decks as opposed to applies for opponents I play against. A lot of the time, just not having a secondary win condition for situations you don't want to end up in, but sometimes do, is how a lot of games end. So, I like having them. You don't have to. Some decks can get away fine without them, but um, mid rangey decks tend to be like a mix where everything just kind of plays for a good amount of value. Um, they can kind of get away without, not, without having these a lot of the time, but if you're playing an engine deck or a control deck or like a pure point slam deck, something that's more in one category than a mix... I should say, you really want to consider what you'll do when you end up in situations that you're not planning for. So in that case, that means we're playing an engine deck. We want to plan for what happens when we're not in a long round where we're strong. So that's why we're having these secondary run conditions. If we're just playing a mid-range deck, like a little bit of rain, we might not have to think about that, but we're definitely going to be thinking about it here. So we know our win conditions. Um, we can always uh, add to these or take them away later, which is important to keep in mind, right? As we add more cards, as we flush out our deck, we might want to add a win condition, maybe take some away, maybe adjust it. So we'll see how that goes. We might come back and change this. But for now, this is our win condition. These are the cards that support it. And let's go into the next step here. For the next step, we're talking about how to support our win condition, right? So we know our win conditions, our primary ones and our secondary ones. Now we want to build our decks up to support them. Most of the time I build to support the primary win condition because the secondary one is not something we want to end up in all the time. So it's something we put less cards in our deck towards. So we're playing an engine deck focused on rain. What else fits best with this? One card we definitely want here is going to be Malusian Cultist. So we can know how to spell. We'll be able to find this pretty quick here. By provisions. So Malusian Cultist. We're going to include this. It's another engine, right? At the end of your turn, we get this boost effect. So that's an engine effect. And it also sets up rain for other cards on this order. And it's also a cultist to help us get that Malusian, her own ability to reset. Overall, fantastic synergy with the decks. So we're definitely including this. And we're going to go with two. Another card that's really good in our strategy, this probably isn't a surprise, is going to be Kelpie. So Kelpie synergizes with our plan of rain because she, well, it slash he slash she, it makes rain. It just makes rain based on the number of beasts in our starting deck. And we take a look at our beasts. We have one, two, we already have four beasts in our deck so it's got good synergy it has really good synergy with making rain for messenger it's got good synergy because it boosts our unboosted units which includes the damaged ones so they partially kill off malusine or she uses her ability or they're damaging our messengers this helps heal them up it's really good we're gonna put that in our deck and we're gonna need to put more beasts in to support this we'll keep that in mind as we go on and if we don't have enough we can always take her out later uh, speaking of beasts and rain i think the next card we want to go with is little half Fru. Little half Rue is somewhere in here, but basically it's a beast, has a bonded effect, it synergizes with our rain, it can make the rain, it has ordered to spawn rain, damaging itself, and this bonded effect increases base power by two, can help us with our revival effects. All around it's a great fit for our deck, and at four provisions, we want to have some of them in here. Speaking of the revival, by the way, we do have already... Messenger from the Sea. This is our big payoff card to our long rounds, right? For all the rain we put out here, we get the Messenger from the Sea value. So we want to be able to have more than two in case the opponent's killing them, which is always very likely. And I can use them more in one round. Like, so if we can bring these back, we can play them two in round one, two in round three, two long rounds. So to do that, I think we want to be going with Freya's Blessing. Two of those. I like Freya's Blessing. It, provides, it plays a bronze on neutral unit from our graveyard, gives it doomed. That's going to be our Messengers from the Sea. Just bring them back fantastic helps support the primary win condition of having these guys so fits perfectly let's add two of these it also works pretty well on the malusian cultist right like cultist springing back is also pretty decent if we haven't used it on message from the sea yet 
And it can work on these little half roos if they got the bonded. It can be decent point slam to get like an eight value bronze back. So, all in all, pretty good. All these cards, all these cards support our win conditions. So, we're adding engines to our deck. We're making effects to make them strong. Whatever your deck is, like this is how we're doing it for a rain deck. Whatever you're playing, it's like at this point we're adding in cards that support our strategy, right? Say you're playing Thrive, you're adding in big cards, more Thrive cards, that type of stuff. For control decks, it usually means adding damage cards. Say you're playing. Madoc bombs, you're adding a Madoc, you're adding a Sappers, things that make more Sappers to support your strategy. And then for Point Slam, it could be things like Osrel to consume your big cards previously if you're playing monsters, or if you're playing um, Skellige and you're playing Point Slam, you're probably playing things to revive, like Point Slam cards you can then support with Fakusha to replay them again, stuff like that. So this is all about making your primary win condition as effective as possible. Once we've done that, we've got the core of our deck more or less. Before we get too far, I do want to talk about something else, which is consistency cards. Before we get into just putting every synergistic card in existence into our deck, we need to remember consistency. It won't do us much good to have all these great cards if we can't play them when we want to or we need them. So I'm going to call cards to help you get to the cards you want, consistency cards for this video. So we could start by putting in the consistency cards, but I like to wait till I've added the key cards for my deck strategy, which we did so far, right? Like these are our primary strategy cards. We could just throw Oniromancy into every deck and call that a day. There's Oniromancy, by the way. I think most of you will know what this does. But that's not always the best choice. And about Devotion, maybe we're playing Devotion. We can't play this because it's a neutral card. We might not have decided if we want to do Devotion or not yet at the start when we're making our deck. So that's why I don't like starting off by putting in the Consistency cards. But you can just throw it in for whatever and change it later. But I tend to end up changing it every time I do that. So I like to add them in at the middle, just put in what fits best. So which cards, which consistency cards do we want, what kind, how many? Nearly all decks will have at least one consistency card, just keep that in mind. So the answer really depends on the strategy and deck you're making. Are you Nilfgaard? I mean, if you're Nilfgaard, just go Yon Calway and you're basically done with tactics, right? You see every gold in your deck, pretty simple. Except it's not that simple. <laughs> not every Nilfgaard deck wants tactics, and you won't get the cards until the next round if you stack some on top of your deck. So the best consistency cards for your deck really depends and it's up to you to decide on them. So as a general rule, I like to ask myself, is there a card I need to see to win this game? If the answer is yes, so for example, in Monsters, there's a Dagon, which is an extremely powerful card you usually want to open with. Um, if you need to play him, I like to play two like two cards to play him out of my deck. So for example, like Whispering Hillock and Royal Decree. Uh, that's a Monsters card, so I can't pull it up right now, but most of you know what I'm talking about. If the answer is no, I usually like to play one. Like I usually play at least one of these cards that play something off our decks, so like I don't, in Oniromancy or a Royal Decree or something is fine. Uh, Oniromancy is a bit weird because it does have that echo on it, so it's kind of different to analyze, but you know what I'm saying overall. Now talking about these consistency cards, there are thinning cards and there's tutoring cards. So most of the cards I've mentioned so far are called Tutor Singwent. These things play cards of your choice. Some of them have limitations out of your deck. So Oniromancy is an example, like play a card from your deck. That is the most generic example of a tutor you can have. Some have uh, limitations on them, so if we take a look and set it Royal Decree, I can only play a unit from your deck. So, those are options. Thinning cards, on the other hand, uh, take cards out of your decks, so you're more likely to draw your good cards later. One of the most common examples of this is most factions have a 5 provision-ish card. They'll fully something out of your deck. So, for example, Shield Maiden. When this takes damage, Summon all copies from your row, deck to your row. You have one in your deck. You hit this. It thins a card out of your deck. Your deck has one less card in it. You're more likely to draw into your good cards later on because this isn't in your deck anymore. That's the idea. Generally, though, in most cases, tutors are more consistent because you get to play the card you want. And they also inherently thin your deck. Right? If you play World Decree, you're taking a card out of your deck. So it's also thinning it. However, they don't add any value to your deck. So if we have these in our deck, these are worth 8 points, right? So it's 8 points added to our deck, where if we just have a Royal Decree, it doesn't add any points to our deck, it just lets us get the cards we need. It's also worth mentioning there's some cards like Maxi and the Cursed Scroll and stuff like that, where you can put a card onto the bottom of your deck. Some of these effects are hard to analyze, like Maxi's ability to look through your deck and such, but for the most part, I'm just considering stuff that puts things on the bottom of your deck as a thinning card, because... Functionally, putting something in the bottom of your deck is the same as removing it from your deck because you're not going to draw it when you're drawing other cards in your deck. You're not going to see it again. So, functionally, it's basically the same as removing it from your deck. 
There's other effects as well, like stacking the top of your deck. We mentioned John Kelway. And those are kind of hard to analyze. Uh, stuff like Ard Fiend as well. But these tend to be better than thinning cards. But worse than tutor cards, right? Because you won't get the cards this round. But It's up to you to decide which of these you need and how many. I tend to use one tutor plus one or more, one or two thinning in most of my decks. So that's usually what I go with. But it depends on the deck. Just keep in mind, if you add too much consistency, you can end up lacking power in your gold cards, right? So if we take a... We're putting in Oniromancy and Royal Decree. That's 22 provisions and two cards, which take up a lot of space that could actually be powerful cards. So finding a balance between your actual big cards and your tutor cards is really important. That's one of the things I find myself most changing in my decks after revising them. It's definitely something worth coming to after playing some games. As far as our deck, our deck's a little bit of an exception with Rain because there's so many thinning cards that synergize with our strategy. So if we take a look, the first of these is going to be Anglerfish. So Anglerfish here, fantastic thinning card for us. Comes out of our deck if there's rain on both enemy rows. So each of them thins. We're going to put two of these in. Because we're playing a rain-based strategy that come out of our deck. And that thins our deck by two, one each. Fantastic for what we're doing. There's another card we want to play here, which is going to be a neutral actually. It is Tempest. So if we take a look at Tempest, this plays all copies of Biting Frog. Biting Frog, no. Biting Frost. Impenetrable Fog or Torrential Rain from our deck. So we're going to play this because we are playing Torrential Rains. So Torrential Rain here, if we can find it, there it is. Spawns Rain for three turns. We're playing a rain-based deck. So this thins our deck by two. We play Tempest, plays these out of our deck. And then we get this out there, which gives us value, synergizes with our deck. Fantastic. So most decks wouldn't include the Rain because that value isn't great compared to other cards. It's pretty terrible in a short round. But since we can thin off Tempest, it's good. And this gives us four thinning with five cards. This is a ton of consistency. Like, this is a lot of consistency. Far more than I play in most decks. The reason we're doing it, though, is because I mentioned these have synergies with our primary strategy. So it helps quite a bit. Uh, it's still worth noting, though, we want to have access to our secondary win condition of reviving Melusine. That relies on being able to revive Ryogan when we need to. And also getting Melusine out early. So to support that, we need a... I think we do need a tutor card to be able to play these at the time we want. I don't think we need the Echo on the Oniromancy for that because we have so much consistency in our thinning. So we're just going to go with a Royal Decree. And that'll be it for our consistency cards. We ended up with a whole bunch though. Alright, the next step I like to take in building my decks is called Covering the Weaknesses. So this is where we look at what our deck's weak to. And we try and adapt to make sure we don't lose because of that is being exploited by our opponents. So as you see, our deck's kind of getting filled up a little bit here. I want to take a look at this step before we completely finish the deck. So that's what we're going to do here. Keep in mind, no deck can be everything, and every deck has a weakness. Like, this is a fact. <laughs> every deck has to have a weakness, and every deck can't beat everything in the game. If this wasn't true, there'd be only one viable deck on the ladder, and we'd play mirror matches all day. So every deck has a weakness, and they all and nothing can really beat anything in the game. Even when... If you remember when Renfrew was first released, she didn't, like, Renfrew decks were so dominant, but they didn't beat everything. So that's just something to keep in mind. But what we can do is try and improve our win rates against the things we're weak to. So it's important to examine our deck and figure out what our weaknesses are and try and compensate for that. So, for example, if we're playing an engine deck, you might be missing control. And if you're playing control deck, you might lack point slam for, like, a short round three. If you're playing a point slam deck, you might lack a wave to get long run value from engines or stop the opponent's engines. So this is the part of the process where I like to look at these things. First, identify my deck's weakness, both so that based on the type of deck it is and on the cards in it. So then I decide if I want to include anything to compensate. You don't have to include cards to compensate. And remember I said, like, you can't make every deck strong against everything. Decide what's important to make it strong against and then decide if it's worth it and what isn't. So as an object, for example, here, we lack control. If we look through our deck, we don't really have ways to kill anything. So one of the things we want to do is, do we want to address it? I guess actually we could kill Neckers, the monsters, one power guy, pretty effectively. But other than that, we don't have control. Is it worth anything putting, was it worth adding anything to fix that? I think it is. So what would be the best card to do that? I think probably Karathi Heatwave. It's just fantastic. It permanently removes everything. Just a blanket answer to the most important thing we need to deal with. Now, is that enough control to address our weakness of not having it? Maybe. We might want to include something cheap, like maybe a Giga Scorpion Decoction would be worth adding. This does damage. That might be worth it. 
Now, the only thing with these is we don't want to be killing off enemy units, so we can't get value from rain. If the rain is not hitting things, we kill all the units, we're losing value. Uh, oh, we could include a lock card, right? Like, look at lock cards. Oh, we want all of them. Like, the lock cards could help quite a bit here, right? Because they deny the opponent's value without removing it from the board. So I think we'll go with one of these. We could go to Regory of Vol. It's just the most generic one. We could go to Jenga Fret. He requires a Bloodthirst, a little less consistent, and Aguara has two more provisions, but does give us that unlock ability. For now, I think we'll go with Dregory of Vol, and if we have extra provisions later on, maybe we'll add in Aguara. So that's what we'll do here for our covering our weaknesses, I think. That should help quite a bit. The next step, this step kind of ties into the last one, which is called Tech Cards. So tech cards are cards that give you more value than you'd expect from a card of its provision in certain situations. But they're situations you're not always guaranteed to get. So for example, Spores is a fantastic example. Sometimes the opponent has a card that's boosted by 120 points and you reset it with Spores and it's 120 for 4, which is just ridiculous. Sometimes they don't have any boosted cards and your Spores plays for like 0 points. So tech cards have that fluctuation where sometimes they're amazing, sometimes they're not great. So you always need to ask yourself if you want to include a tech card or not, maybe one or two, and if it's worth it. And then you ask if how it comes up against the meta, the cards and decks you're playing against, and that you've been facing. They can be really good for covering your weaknesses, by having fantastic value against things you're weak to. So for example, maybe you're weak to point slam, right? And you're not doing well against decks with a massive round three finisher, like an Osrel. Maybe spores of the card for you then, because it removes all those points. So stuff like that. Consider what you're weak to, and then if you want to tech against it, you can. It's important to remember that tech cards are better in consistent decks, because you are more able to play the tech card at the correct scenario. This is especially true because you usually tend to play one of tech cards. So if your deck's really good at finding one of cards, or finding cards in a certain time, because it's consistent, they get more value, and you can match them up against the things you want to more often. It's also, keep in mind, like, a, lo a little tech cards go a long way. I usually don't play more than, like, two tech cards in any deck. Because if you try and counter every deck that exists, you end up countering nothing. Because you'll, your tech cards are really good against one deck, aren't necessarily good against other decks. You end up losing a lot of value. So you really can't counter everything with tech cards. I'd say, like, use one or two is usually the best idea. I like to, like, maybe play one tech card against my deck's big biggest weakness. And I'll play, like, one against something that the meta is really using. Like I said, this ties in a bit to the weaknesses thing we talked about before. But tech cards generally just things you can slot into your deck that just counter the opponent's things that they're doing. Whereas the other cards we're talking about, like, they help us in the weaknesses. Like, the covering the weaknesses, I wouldn't consider all those tech cards. Like, Karathi Heatwave's not a tech card, necessarily. But tech cards generally are these cheaper, lower provision ones that have a specific use. So, like I said, we're an engine deck. We're vulnerable to control. It's not as bad as some decks. Messenger of the Sea in particular is not too vulnerable because it does usually boost to 6 from this, which gets us out of range of most bronze removal. And if they're using gold removal on our bronze cards, that's usually a good thing. Even if it's interrupting our strategy. The only the exception to this is like we're super weak to locks right now. Because locks, there are bronze locks, especially Nilfgaard, that will shut down our messengers from the sea. And that's not great. Like we're really weak to those. What I'm thinking of right here is going to be the Nilfgaard decks that rely on Masquerade Ball that play a bunch of Aristocrats and statuses. They have tons of locks from their bronzes. That's something we're extremely weak to. So do we want to tech against it? I think I think including a Purify card would be good. So we also have a couple Alchemies, right? We got Freya's Blessings. So we'll go in here with Gremist, I think, for our Purify. I kind of like that. We could go with a Pallor, the 4 Provision guy, instead. But I think this is a nice one. It gives us an alternative. We can bring this back with our Fakusha or something if it's right. We can also use it to purify the things that brings back. Maybe play them again in some situations. And it kind of supports... It just kind of supports the deck. So I think we'll go with the Gramastir. Let's see. What else are we weak to? We're weak to our Malusian getting removed, right? We lose our best short round then. So how do we stop that? We could play a Defender so she can't get heat waved. That will help protect our messengers from the sea, which is our primary win condition. Do I think that is worth it to attack against by putting a defender in? I'm not sure. Right? The defender gets a, a nice target for Fakusha, and especially the right if we don't have our Malusine. 
Yeah, but it would be the last expensive card we could really fit in our deck, I think. So I'll, I'll think about it, maybe. Now, just general check cards. We want to tech against anything. I think we'll put in a Squirrel. So Squirrel's a decent tech card. I don't think we want to go Spores, necessarily. I like Squirrels. Just having the option to banish something's good. Sometimes that's really nice. Sometimes it isn't. But one thing we're weak to, like I said, is Control. One of the Control decks is Madoc with the Bombs. Having a tech card like Squirrel to counteract the Madoc and banish him could be really helpful. So that's going to be it for tech cards, I think. Just Squirrel, kind of grimaced. But yeah, that's what we'll be going with. Alright, next up, we'll call this filling up the corners. Uh, we're basically, we're not basically, we're getting pretty close to being done with our deck. And we just need to finish up filling it in. So at this point, I'd like to go through what are the things we're missing. Is there anything we should have that we forgot? Stuff like that. I just want to make sure I don't have an obvious thing I forgot in our fort and synergy or combo we don't have something for. So we take a look through our main strategies and main combos here. Uh, we talked about with this with Defender. We don't, we actually don't have many targets for our reviving, right? We've got F Fukusha here. And the Singer is right, we want to play on big cards. We only really have Malusine and the Rio Goddess target. I guess Kelpie's okay. So that could be something we're lacking is revive targets here. Uh, is that fine if I like banish one of these? I think it's okay just because we can use Fakusha on a bronze for good value, right? We get Fakusha like a little half through. We get six turns of rain off the Fakusha. That's still enough value. And we can use the right on the Malusine or the Ryogan, whichever one's not banished from a Squirrel, for example. So I think that's fine. We'll leave that. We might come back, though. Uh, let's see. What else we have for combos? Oh, we're, I guess we're a bit short on Cultist from Malusine, right? We've got Malusine Cultist, but I think that's it. Yeah, we're short on Cultist. Do we need more? Um, I would like more. I was like always like refreshing her order, but... We do f the blessings. So I guess if we bring them, we could bring them back. I don't, I don't think it's super important. But we might add more later. I think we'll just wait and see on that one. So as far as Kelpie, that was the last thing we wanted to mention. We talked about this earlier. We checked how many beasts we have. We've got the Fakusha. One, two, three. Uh, we've got four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine. We got ten. That's plenty. So she's fine. Uh, we also kind of put the squirrel in because it is a beast. I'm not sure I mentioned that, but part of the thing about squirrels, it is a beast which has synergies with our deck. Since that was part of the reason we might consider coming it, but we'll see. Other than that, I think we're all set. We have a lot of spare provisions, right? We can fit in. We got four cards and 25 provisions. We can fit in another big card in, or maybe two. I think mostly just one big card. We do have a lot of the provisions. What can we add? Let's go to Skellige. What can we add here? Well, ooh, ooh, that's interesting. We could add Otkel. He's pretty new, as of this recording at least. So damage self down to one play all copies of Freya's Blessings. Ooh, that has some potential. We're playing two Freya's Blessings already. We are playing a very consistent deck with four thinning from five thinning cards and then a tutor. So we're most likely to have that set up. Well, that sounds really good, actually. We could get a different win condition, right? We talked about our win conditions earlier. A short round three could just be... Like, a short round win condition could be Otkel into two messengers, for example. Maybe with a leader charge. Uh, Bride of the Sea would be pretty good for playing one of these, too. We're playing a Freya's Blessing. Here's the thing, though. We're already bringing back the messengers with the Blessing. At least once, because we're playing the Blessings. So, they get doomed. If without the Messengers, there's nothing fantastic for the Blessings. Like, Messenger or Cultist is good, but so is Little half I suppose. We're not that exciting. So, as much as I like this idea, I think we'll leave it out for now, see if there's anything better. Like I said, we do have room for one more expensive card. I think it's going to be either Fulmar or we come back and put the Defender in. Hmm, look what we're missing here. How's our tempo plays looking? Not great, actually. Yeah, we're kind of missing tempo. So as much as the defender would support our primary strategy of just, like, protecting our rain and stuff, I think addressing one of our weaknesses here, which I don't think we mentioned in the weakness sections, I think we're actually short on tempo. Yeah, we look to be pretty short on tempo plays, so I think Fulmar might be the choice here. 
He does love a defender to keep him alive, but we are playing a ton of engines, so I probably can't answer everything. So yeah, yeah, he'll help because we're missing tempo plays. So I think that's a good idea. At this point, I think we're going to miss... We're missing two bronzes here at four provisions. And then we're missing at five here. Oh, of course. <laughs> That's what it is. I was trying to figure out. I thought we mentioned this card. But yeah, when I mentioned this part where we fill up the corners, we check and make sure we didn't forget anything. And we forgot. So we forgot to put these torrential rains in. I talked about them, never clicked on them. That makes perfect sense. Okay. I thought we were forgetting something. It's part of the step, isn't it? And so now we're here with five provisions. I think we go to Skellige, five provisions. We just pick a card that looks like it goes well with the deck. And for that, mm, I think we'll go, yeah, let's go Sea Serpent. Let's put in the Sea Serpent. Has some potential. Synergizes with our long round stuff. Gives us a bit of control too. That three damage helps out there. So yeah, we'll add that. All right, now we have to finish up the deck. First thing is we have to make sure we add this Crystal Skull in so we don't forget that. And then we go through, make sure we didn't forget anything, which is that step. And then making sure that we have everything we want. So I like in this part to classify the type of cards in our deck and see just how many of each type we have. So if we take a look, we have six consistency cards, one tutor and five thinning cards. Like I said, we got four thinning off of those. That is a ton of consistency, way more than I normally play. But since Anglerfish and Rains can also be considered like part of our core strategy of the rain stuff. I think this is fine. And they kind of overlap. Cards can overlap in this part. They've got, other than that, 15 core strategy cards. We're counting their other ones for our consistency just for this purpose. So I think that's plenty. We've got enough. We should be able to make good use of our rain, good use of our messengers. That should be enough to like carry our strategy throughout the game. If, we only, if you only end up with like 10 or so, maybe like eight cards for your core strategy, it might be worth looking at your core strategy and wondering if it's more of a secondary one and you want to support it with something else. That's why it's, I like looking at the number of cards of each type. But 15 here should be good. Next up, we have two control cards, right? We've got Diregory with his lock and Heat Wave. I think that's fine. We, we, do, we are lacking control, but it's going to be a feature of our deck. We're going to rely more on our engines. I like what we have, I think. And we've got two tech cards. We're calling Grimace a tech card here. As we're attacking against the lock decks with all those locks with his purify and then we've got the squirrel as we look through this though grimace might be a little weak here right we only have the two alchemies for his refresh the two freya's blessing so we might actually i think we'll just swap him out with a peller because his advantage over the peller tends to be the refresh on his order because it doesn't matter like it doesn't matter if they they die because they get their ability on deploy He's too value for two more provisions in the Peller, but really Grammas is here for the reset. When you play an Alchemy, we don't have that many. So I think we'll actually swap that for a Peller. I like that. And then as far as the rest of this, I said part of the reason we picked Squirrel is because of Beast. I think we'll cut it. I don't think we need it necessarily. We have enough Beasts. And because of that, I'm not as keen on the Squirrel. So that's fine. And one more thing is when we're talking about Axel... Or not Axel. We're talking about... We're going to mention Axel here. We're talking about the Revivus Melusine. We're talking about how we don't have that many tempo plays when we added Falmar in. I think a really good tempo play would be to add Axel Three Eyes. So where is he? Like Axel Three Eyes gives us 11 on his play. On his deploy, which is really good. It's also a fantastic card to revive with Fakusha. Probably better than Ryogan if we're in a short round. So I think he's definitely worth including. I feel, yeah, yeah, I feel a lot better about this. That'll help a lot. It's also better in Corrupted Flaminica, I think. Just because we don't have... We allow duplicates of our beasts. We only have nine total. That makes me feel a lot better. And then we're one provision over. So we'll take out the Sea Serpent. And we got four provisions. We could go for that squirrel. But I'm feeling that... I'm feeling a little... Actually more like we might want a... Probably a Megascope actually. Here's what I'm thinking about Megascope. Is at this point we have good tech. Like we've got the Peller. I don't think we need the Squirrel Tech card. Like I thought about it as we're going through. I don't think we necessarily need it. So we'll go with a Megascope. Just because it gives us another um, Messenger from the Sea, which is really handy. Especially if they're locking us, right? I was talking about how locking is a weakness. 
And we can create another one of these off of a mega scope that helps against that too. So we'll do that. We got some good targets. It's also pretty good on Malusine Cultus. So overall, quite like that idea. The last step I take here is going to be what we call Verizing. So we're done, right? We made the deck. We're done, right? Not really, kind of. One of the most important parts of building a deck is going back after you've played some games to improve it. So we went and did that in the meantime. And don't go back after every game. Though. Like If you go back after every game and change a card, you never really understand or see how that change impacts your deck. I mean, if you forgot something, like say we forgot the Ryogan, like say we forgot the Fukushima, so we can't revive the Ryogan, then yeah, go back and fix it. But if you're just going to go back after every game and change a card, you won't really understand how each change is impacting the deck. Like, not really. So I, I like to go back after at least 10-ish at least, at least games and then maybe change a card. And that's what I like to do. I also recommend, like, if you go back and change cards, just change, like, one or two at a time. Otherwise, it's kind of hard to see what's causing you to win or lose more games after doing that. It's usually easier to determine what's going on if you're changing less cards at once, right? Make the small changes, play some more games, come back and make the extra changes you feel you need to after that. And then one last tip I like to say is for when you're revising a deck, if you have some ideas about what you would change, keep them in mind when you're playing, right? So, for example, we put in that mega scope over the squirrel at the end there. After a couple games, I was wondering if maybe the squirrel would have been better. So what I do, I keep in mind that we might want to swap the mega scope for a squirrel. Every time we draw into the mega scope, I think, would the squirrel be better here? And when we play the mega scope, I think, would the squirrel have been better to play here? And then, after doing that for a few games, I realized that I actually know, I think the mega scope is generally better here. So we end up keeping the mega scope and not changing our deck. So that can be helpful if you're thinking about what changes you want to make while you're playing. Because sometimes you think you might need a change, and as you go through and you're like, hey, actually, um, this card is better here each time you draw into it. Something like that. So sometimes it's good to keep that in mind because you might think you need something when you don't actually. After all of our going through our games, playing like 15, 20 games with this deck, I think actually it's good. And I like it how it is, but I think we're going to keep it the same. And that's it, guys. That's how I go through make a deck. Hopefully you guys found it informative and helpful. Um, it took a lot of effort to make this, so hopefully you did. And feel free to leave any questions or any suggestions in the comment for other people about how you make your decks. I'm going to be doing a few more of these general strategy guides since it's the stuff you guys voted on in the poll I did about more extra content. Let me know what you thought about this and what other topics you want me to cover. Hopefully you enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next one. That'll be it for this one, guys. Hope you enjoyed. We'll see you next time. Make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more. And you can check out some more videos over here. And thanks for watching.